I knew Santos Dumont because he was a member of the Aero Club of France, and of course I met him there. And I have seen him several times. I had dinner with him. I can't say that I'm very friendly with him, but I had many conversations with him. He was a very strange man, very small, very nervous, and he was not like other men. He designed himself and made all the mechanical parts of 16 airships. And about, it's very difficult to know how many, because he was altering these machines from one kind to another, 10 airplanes. And he liked small things. He had the smallest free balloon in the world. He had the smallest airship in the world, and he had the smallest airplane. Blariot was a very impressive man, because his face was a very strong one, with a large nose, a very serious one. He never smiled. He was impressive by himself, and impressive by his work. You know, his crossing the channel was something. I was not there, but I remember the feeling of everybody at the time. It was one of the milestones in the history of aviation, and more than that, it was a milestone in the history of Great Britain, because Great Britain felt immediately that it was no more an island. It was said so in the papers, and it was the general feeling. Ross Brown, contemporary of the early great aviators, recalls his introduction to Louis Blériot. Mr. Blériot had been quite a successful manufacturer of lamps for automobiles before he got started in the aviation game. I was introduced through an artist friend of mine and went over to the factory and called up Mr. Blériot. He could speak very little English, and I could speak less French. But fortunately, there was a young chap there who proved to be just my age, named Roland Garros. He became quite well known as an aviator in later years. Garros and I seemed to take to each other immediately, and he was my main avenue of approach to get through in French. Fortunately, Mr. Blériot seemed to like me, and I was very fond of him. A lovely gentleman, very warm-hearted, and he took an interest, it seemed, in everybody. Mr. Blario was wonderful about taking new ideas or new innovations. He'd take a suggestion from anyone, and he would look at it and think it over and try it out. And if he didn't find it feasible, he'd discard it. In 1909, Glenn Curtis designed, built, and flew the Rams Racer in the Gordon Bennett Cup race in Rams, France. We were flying Jennies. First of all, we had what was called a depth control, which is a wheel. Then the Canadians decided to try the sticks. There was a lot of difference between flying with a stick and with a wheel. With a wheel, you flew like with an automobile. With a stick, for a long time, you just didn't feel secure. We had a rev counter, which told us the revolutions of our motor. We had a gasoline gauge and an oil gauge, and that's all we had. The way you knew you were flying all right was, if you were coming in for a landing and didn't hear the whistle in your wires, you were going too slow and were going to stall. If the wires screamed, you were going too fast. It was seat of the pants flying, that's what it was. The Henri Farman III is the first airplane to have fully functioning ailerons, providing control in the roll axis. The Wright's method of roll control was through warping the wings. Even the Wrights ultimately moved ailerons as a means of controlling the roll or bank of an airplane. The Wright EX was the plane flown by Cal Rogers on the first transcontinental flight. The flight was sponsored by the Armour Food Company to promote its grape drink, Vin Fizz. During his trip, enough replacement parts followed Rogers by train to build four airplanes. He needed most of them as he crashed his way across the country. Only a few parts of the original plane remained when he reached his destination, the Pacific Ocean. Only two Fokker T2s were ever built, 
but one of them became the plane in which the first nonstop flight across the U.S. was made. Early designers were divided into two camps, biplane design like the Wright's craft and monoplane design like the Moran Saunier. The box-like construction of biplanes made them strong, but it also made them slow. Monoplane designers, seeking increased speed through reduced drag, were willing to sacrifice the inherent strength of the biplane. Though the biplane would fly into the 1930s, the Moran Saunier proved itself in speed, altitude, distance, and combat. Many said Hugo Junker's first design, the J-1, was the airplane of the future. The low-wing monoplane had no external struts and was made of metal. Although heavy, the design concept would be proven by time as lightweight metals and more powerful engines became available. Harry Bruno made his first flight in a plane he and some friends had built in a basement. He went on to compete in air shows. Here he remembers flying the JN-4. We were flying jennies. First of all, we had what was called a depth control, which is a wheel. Then the Canadians decided to try the sticks. There was a lot of difference between flying with a stick and with a wheel. With a wheel, you flew like with an automobile. With a stick, for a long time, you just didn't feel secure. We had a rev counter, which told us the revolutions of our motor. We had a gasoline gauge and an oil gauge, and that's all we had. The way you knew you were flying all right was if you were coming in for a landing and didn't hear the whistle in your wires, you were going too slow, and we're going to stall. If the wires screamed, you were going too fast. It was seat of the pants flying, that's what it was. Best known as the standard training plane for pilots during World War I, the Jenny often stalled out with the least provocation. It was thought that a pilot who could master the Jenny could most likely handle any of the era's other flying machines. The Sopwith Camel was the most successful British single-seat fighter plane of World War I. A good match for the vaunted Fokker D-7, the Camel is credited with over a thousand victories in air-to-air -air combat, including the final triumph over the Red Baron, Manfred von Richthofen. The British-designed DH-4 was mass-produced in the United States during World War I. In fact, it was the only American-built plane to fly in combat. The DH-4 is better known for its service after the war, when it was used by barnstormers, airmail pilots, and the U.S. military. Charles Lindbergh flew one as an airmail pilot, and Jimmy Doolittle set a transcontinental record in another. The Fokker DR-1 is easily identified because of its three short wings. The designers felt that the third wing provided extra lift, and because the wings were short, the airplane was highly maneuverable. Much to Fokker's dismay, the extra wing added drag, and the triplane never came into vogue as a viable design alternative. The Fokker D-7 is said to have been the best fighter plane of World War I. It flew higher and faster than the Sopwith Camel. The plane so impressed the Allies that the Versailles Peace Treaty specified that all Fokker D-7s were to be turned over to the victors. But Anthony Fokker managed to smuggle a few into Holland, and upon these... He founded his company. Designed as a bomber, the Vickers Vimy gained its greatest fame as a long-distance flyer after World War I. A modified Vimy carried John Alcock and Arthur Witten Brown on the first nonstop crossing of the Atlantic and also carried the Smith brothers on the first flight from Britain to Australia. Lieutenant John McCready was the man who, in 1923, made the first nonstop flight across the United States. Here he recalls early flights on the Fokker. We were flying the test model of the two-engine Fokker plane. We'd bring it down, and there would be a lot of things wrong with it. I would talk with Fokker, and we would discuss it there on the apron, and then Fokker would come out after night when the field was closed. He would put on a pair of coveralls, his mechanics outfit, take a welding torch, and it would get right into that plane. It was his, you see, but he'd turned it over to the government. 
He'd get in there with a welding torch and cut about that much off the fuselage. It was all steel tubing. He would take a look at that flipper and cut a chunk off that flipper and weld it together. He built things himself, you see. He would just get in there and remodel that plane personally himself with a direct labor welding torch. I guess he made millions. He had factories and things like that. But he was just a mechanic type. Very intelligent fellow. Very interesting fellow. Anthony Foker's name is synonymous with great airplanes. His World War I fighters became legendary. His post-war F-7 took aerial pathfinders on some of the great distance flights of the 20s. Today, new airplanes carrying the Fokker name continue to explore the skies. Jacqueline Cochran, a racing pilot and holder of numerous air records, became head of the U.S. Women Air Force Service pilots in the 1940s. Here she remembers flying the GB, regarded by many pilots as the most dangerous plane ever built. The GB was an experimental airplane. There were about 11 GBs built, and I believe I was the only one who ever owned one who was not killed in it. Mine also killed its subsequent owner. GB stood for Granville Brothers, the builders. The planes were fast for their time, but unstable and dangerous. There are only four pilots living, I believe, who have flown them. Jimmy Doolittle is one of them. I became very worried about this plane because it would just start to stall at times without regard to its indicated airspeed. They were killers. The Supermarine S-6B is about one thing, speed. Designed by R.J. Mitchell to compete in the Schneider Trophy race, it retired the prize for all time to Great Britain. The S-6B also became the first airplane to exceed 400 miles per hour. Though built for a specific race, the lessons it taught in aerodynamics and engine design would be applied to the development of one of the great fighters of all time, the Supermarine Spitfire. Following the Vega, the Lockheed L-10 Electra was the company's commitment to advancing technology in the 1930s. The L-10 was a high-speed, twin-engine, all-metal, cantilevered, low-wing airliner. The airplane is probably best known, however, as the one flown by Amelia Earhart on her final flight. Considered Howard Hughes' masterpiece, the beautiful H-1 was designed to be the fastest plane in the world. One of the great fighters of World War II, the BF-109, began service with the Condor Squadron during the Spanish Revolution in 1936. During World War II, all of Germany's top aces spent time in the Messerschmitt. Nearly 35,000 of them were built, making it one of the largest production runs in history. The P-40 was designed in the 1930s and was considered to be out of date by combat standards when World War II started. Its performance was outclassed by enemy fighters, but the Warhawk often prevailed in combat because it was sturdy and its pilots highly skilled. Serving in nearly every theater of the war, the P-40 is best known as the shark-toothed fighter of the Flying Tigers in China. The Folk Wolf 190 was perhaps the most advanced propeller-driven airplane to enter World War II. Like the Spitfire, the 190 was the culmination of design lessons learned from racing planes and applied to fighters. The compact airframe carrying a powerful radial engine bears a striking resemblance to the Hughes H-1. The Stratoliner was named for the realm in which it would fly. Before its introduction, airliners had to fly through whatever weather and bruising turbulence nature had to offer. Then came the Stratoliner. It was the first pressurized airliner, which enabled it to fly above weather and rough air that limited other commercial aircraft of the era. Developed by Boeing in the late 30s, the B-17 Flying Fortress was truly a risk. Funded as a private venture, Boeing hoped the aircraft would lead them to future government contracts. Joined by Douglas and Lockheed, Boeing's gamble paid off. 
They supplied 12,000 aircraft by the end of World War II. The B-24 Liberator, designed to replace the Boeing B-17, was an uncompromised design intended for a specific task, carrying heavy bomb loads to a distant enemy on daytime raids. The large four-engine bomber was one of the workhorses of World War II. Named after aviation pioneer Billy Mitchell, the North American B-25 Mitchell was developed as a mid-sized bomber. Known for its loud twin engines and varied use during World War II, the B-25 could strafe as well as bomb. The largest production run of all American medium bombers in World War II, the B-25 is best known for the successful raid on Tokyo led by Jimmy Doolittle in April of 1942. Alexander Cartvelli, designer of the Republic P-47 Thunderbolt, remembers some of his concerns as the P-47 was being built. When we were building the first Thunderbolt, we didn't know yet whether it was going to work or not, or how. My factory was being built, and every time I'd look at that factory growing, I said, what if my airplane won't run? What'll I do with the factory? It was quite an exciting period, but fortunately everything turned out all right and we built 16,000 of those airplanes during the war. Toward the end of the war, we were knocking out, at eh, this place and our other factory, almost 25 a day, something like that. The P-47 was the biggest and fastest single-engine fighter of World War II. It became known as the Juggernaut because of its size and firepower. With its huge engine, the P-47 could nearly reach the speed of sound in a dive. Because of buffeting and control problems experienced by pilots at this speed, the concept of the sound barrier came into being and became the next great challenge for the Dreamers. Entering the service in 1944, the Messerschmitt ME-262 was the first turbojet fighter plane to go into action. Unlike the straight-wing design of the American fighters of the day, it had wings which swept back at a 30-degree angle. Introduced at the tail end of the war, this German fighter might have had a significant effect on the outcome of the war had the Third Reich recognized the potential of fighter jets. Building upon the success of the B-17, Boeing constructed a long-range mid-sized bomber designated the B-29 Superfortress. Utilizing the first pressurized cabins for high-altitude flying, the B-29 was introduced during the final years of World War II. Achieving great victories in the Pacific, the B-29 is best known for bringing the war to a close in August of 1945. A B-29, the Enola Gay, dropped the first atomic bomb on the city of Hiroshima, ushering in the atomic age. Initially developed and built by Lockheed as a transcontinental airliner in 1939, the Lockheed Model 49 Constellation was adapted for military air transport use during the war years and renamed the C-69. At the conclusion of the war, the Constellation was once again devoted to commercial transport. Considered by many to be the most elegant airplane ever to fly, it became a favorite of both airlines and passengers. Jack Northrop's XB-35 flying wing was the airplane reduced to its essential form. With no fuselage or tail, the flying wing maximized lift and minimized drag. The XB-35 was modified to utilize jet power and was designated the YB-49. The flying wing was one of the fastest and most efficient planes of its time, but it lacked the capacity to carry an atomic bomb. The Air Force scrapped the flying wings in favor of conventional bombers. Debuted in 1947, the Boeing B-47 Stratojet was to shape a generation of multi-engine jets to come, both military and commercial. It was the first large jetliner to have wings which swept back and engines that were hung below the wings. 
This engine configuration would appear on multi-engine jets built not only by Boeing, but by Douglas, Convair, and Lockheed as well. De Havilland had built an operational jet fighter during World War II and was eager to put the technology to use in the civilian world. He saw the future, and the future was jet airliners. The Comet was the first one in service. But the Comet was flying into the unknown. Mental fatigue problems never experienced before in propeller-driven airplanes would bring down the Comet, literally and figuratively. Beginning with the DC-2 and 3, the Douglas DC-7 was the last of the company's great piston-engine airliners. Designed for non-stop coast-to-coast -coast service, the DC-7 signaled the end of an era. The rumbling of four huge radial engines in full song was soon to be replaced by the thunder of jets. Built in 1958, the McDonnell Douglas F-4 Phantom is perhaps the best all-around combat plane of its time. By 1962, the F-4 was demonstrating unprecedented performance, convincing the U.S. Air Force to place it in the Tactical Air Command. The only production Navy fighter to win an Air Force contract, the Phantom has served with the Navy, Marines, and Air Force in a variety of roles and is still in service today. If the Boeing 707 was an innovation, the Douglas DC-8 established the convention. It was now clear that in the future, all large airliners would be jet-powered. While Douglas had been considering jet-powered airliners after the war, Boeing forced the decision. The DC-8 stayed in production for over 20 years. Designed by Kelly Johnson and the Lockheed Skunk Works, the Lockheed SR-71 became the fastest jet plane in the history of flight, setting speed records of over 2,000 miles per hour. The successor to the U-2 spy plane, the Blackbird was designed as an intelligence-gathering aircraft, capable of photographing 100,000 square miles per hour while traveling at Mach 3 at 80,000 feet. By the end of the 1960s, Boeing and Juan Tripp of Pan American Airways knew that the next step in commercial aviation was to increase the capacity of the airplane. The first jumbo jet, the giant Boeing 747, was the result. Boeing designed it, and Pan Am put it in service. The 747 could carry twice as many passengers as contemporary airliners. Once again, Boeing and Pan Am had set the mark for the commercial aviation industry to match. Designed as a daylight fighter, the F-16 has evolved into a true multi-role combat plane, capable of air-to-surface attack and all-weather flying. First introduced in 1978, the plane, which is extremely popular with pilots, is still in use 18 years later by air forces around the world. Introduced in 1978, the McDonnell Douglas F-18 Hornet has become the Navy's frontline fighter. It replaced the well-known F-4 Phantom in both the Navy and the Marines. The Hornet is most familiar to the public as the plane flown by the Navy's precision flying team, the Blue Angels. The Voyager was designed and built for one flight, around the world, non-stop, without refueling. Built of lightweight materials and designed for extended low-speed flight, the Voyager was the perfect application of technology to achieve a specific purpose. The airplane and the flight harken back to the early days of aviation when innovators designed, built, and flew unique airplanes to achieve self-defined goals. In a time of hypersonic speeds and massive government involvement in aviation, the Voyager and its nine-day traverse of the globe truly embodied the dreams of flight. Ross Brown, contemporary of the early great aviators, remembers Wilbur Wright's concerns about the future of the airplane and the implications of flight. Wright said, I hope it will never be used in war. Well, that was the first thing they did use it for, as a matter of fact. I'll tell you, of all of the people that I've met in the early days of aviation, outside of the Army and Navy maybe, very few of them thought very much of the consequences for war. They didn't give too much thought to it. Mostly, you see, it was an exhibition. It was a toy. It was a toy, but it was a dangerous toy. The Newport 17 was the best of the formidable Newports in World War I. 
It's famous not only as a fighter, but for the pilots who flew it, including the Canadian ace Billy Bishop, who scored 72 kills, and Eddie Rickenbacker with 26. The Newport 17 is synonymous with World War I fighters and aces. Ben O. Howard, a racing pilot and designer, remembers the reaction of his fellow pilots when the DC-3 was introduced. Well, during the war, you know, things moved forward awfully fast. What had been considered tremendously complicated things all of a sudden became real simple, you know. For instance, the DC-3 at one time. Well, airline pilots quit their jobs flying on the airlines when they brought the DC-3 along because it was just too big and complicated to fly. There was too much for one person to think about. Yet it turned out that kids could fly them with practically nothing but somebody pointing out the things to them. The commercial effect of the DC-3 is described here by Cyrus R. Smith, former president of American Airlines and a pioneer in commercial aviation since 1923. Now, we wanted an airplane that if we did get a reasonable passenger load on it, we'd at least break even and, and possibly make a little money. So the DC-3 did two things as compared with the DC-2. First, it was a 21-passenger airplane, so therefore it had 50% more seats in it, and secondly, it was a little bit faster. It was probably the first economic opportunity that the airlines ever had to have a profit in the passenger business without an airmail subsidy. Now, we did quite a lot of work with Douglas on it. Of course, everyone has the inclination to claim that they invented an airplane. I think often that American has claimed more credit for the DC-3 than it's really entitled to, because the airplane was designed and built by Douglas. But I think it is true that we called Douglas's attention to the need for a more efficient airplane, and we gave Douglas the benefit of our experience in the business, and we aided Douglas in working up the specifications of the airplane. I think we made some contribution to the DC-3, and of course we made a very substantial contribution because we were the first people who purchased it. Now, Douglas didn't want to build the airplane unless somebody would buy it. And we told Douglas that we'd buy a quantity of them if they lived up to the specifications. So we aided him in the designing of the airplane, and we were the first operator of the DC-3. The Supermarine Spitfire, the symbol of the Battle of Britain, is one of the greatest fighters of World War II. This airplane is the direct descendant of R.J. Mitchell's powerful Supermarine Racers that won the Schneider Trophy for Britain four times. Alexander Cartvelli, designer of the Republic P-47 Thunderbolt, calls the Boeing 707 an example of the relationship between beauty and efficiency in aircraft. Usually, experience has shown that the laws of aerodynamics and the laws of aesthetics are kind of converging. They're the same. What looks right aesthetically and artistically is usually successful aerodynamically. For instance, you take the 707 jet transport. You ever seen it? It's a beautiful, beautiful airplane, and yet the most efficient airplane this country has. Usually, the beauty and the aerodynamic efficiencies go together. Unveiled in November of 1988, the Northrop B-2 Stealth was designed as a strategic bomber. Its name refers to its ability to avoid enemy detection systems. Its unusual bat-like shape is not a modern innovation, but followed the design of the XB-35 flying wing of the 1940s. The similarities with Northrop's earlier model serves as a reminder of Jack Northrop's vision of aviation's future.